Well, I now want to talk about something called the Coriolis Effect. And the Coriolis Effect, unfortunately, is one of those things that gets taught poorly, uh, it's oft misunderstood, and it can even cost you some money if you're visiting in Ecuador and you fall prey to one of the Coriolis Effect schemes that you might find in one of those places. Now, I have never experienced those places personally, but I've heard about them. The Coriolis Effect, in its simplest sense, is simply a way of explaining the movement of objects over a rotating Earth. So if you think about flying in an airplane, or clouds moving over the surface of the Earth, or even water moving over the surface of the Earth, the Earth is turning underneath them. And the Coriolis Effect is simply a way to account for the rotation of the Earth beneath those moving objects. In its most basic sense, that's what the Coriolis Effect is about. It's actually, in some sense, just a mathematical correction. It's not a force that's exerted by the turning of the Earth or anything like that. There's various analogies that are used, whether it's a merry-go-round or a record player and all these different kinds of things, and they're partly right, and they might help you a little bit understand what the Coriolis Effect is about. But in fact, they don't really do a very good job, and they're an incomplete job of explaining the Coriolis Effect. So. If you're really interested in the Coriolis effect then and really need to know it for something, then I suggest you study some of the more advanced topics and even get into some of the mathematics of the Coriolis effect. But if you're just a lay person just trying to get through an oceanography class or just trying to kind of understand vaguely why certain things happen in terms of movements of objects or the circulation of the ocean or the circulation of uh, uh, patterns of hurricanes and those kinds of things, then there's really only two simple things you need to remember. One is northern hemisphere right, the second is southern hemisphere left. If you can remember that, northern hemisphere to the right, southern hemisphere to the left, then you can just skip the rest of this video and skip the rest of the pages in the book and go on to the next section, okay? But moving objects, things that are moving across the surface of the earth, in the northern hemisphere from an observer from from an observer in outer space it actually looks like they're moving towards the right that same observer in outer space watching a cloud or an airplane move across the surface of the earth it actually looks like that object is moving off to the left now you might be wondering why and if you're wondering why then again you're one of those people that needs to go to the mathematics or go to the advanced sections of the book and study the Coriolis effect. This is just one of those cases where it's just better not to ask why. But of course it's always better to ask why if you're studying in a science class. But just to keep it simple and to avoid the very complicated explanations and somewhat sometimes erroneous explanations, if you just remember moving objects in the northern hemisphere tend towards the right, moving objects in the southern hemisphere tend towards the left, your Coriolis lessons will be better preserved and will be better, more clear to you if you just remember that kind of stuff. Now you can go to a website called Bad Coriolis. They have some wonderful examples and some wonderful explanations there. Um, they might get you a little bit further along with an understanding of Coriolis effect if you're interested in it. Otherwise, you can take a look at some of the pages in the book as well. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail than I just gave you. Okay, as you know, Earth rotates on its axis once each day. And hopefully you know what direction does it rotate from where you are sitting? Hmm, Earth rises, the, excuse me, the sun rises in the east, so that means Earth is moving towards the east, okay? <coughs> Earth's rotation beneath moving objects, as I said before, has consequences for the apparent path of those objects relative to the moving Earth. And here's what I just told you, in the northern hemisphere, moving objects appear to move or appear to be deflected to the right in the southern hemisphere they appear to be deflected to the left and that deflection is called the Coriolis effect well let's look at one aspect of the earth's rotation and it will help us understand it a little bit an object on the equator as the earth is rotating towards the east from, again, an observer out in outer space, it looks like that object or person standing here in Africa 
is moving at 464 meters per second. And that's just as the Earth rotates once on its axis each day, people living on the equator are in essence moving around very quickly. This is the speed of a person, um, what's called the tangential speed, but it just means the speed as if you were going in a straight line, okay, uh, around the circumference of the Earth. Of course, halfway up, you're going, or almost halfway up, you're going much more slowly. And at the pole, you're not moving around to the east at all. All you're doing at the pole is simply rotating. So the Coriolis effect actually has two components. It has the actual speed component, which is what you're experiencing at the equator, and it has the rotational component. And it's those two components of the Coriolis effect that get messed up in examples like a turntable or examples like a merry-go-round and those kinds of things. The turntable and merry-go-round examples, and I'll give you one here in a few minutes, are good examples in terms of kind of conceptualizing and kind of giving you some idea of what the Coriolis effect is like, but mathematically they kind of fall apart. And that's why people that are Coriolis hardcores uh, hardcore scientists that want to, you know, make everything be very specific and exactly correct, um, kind of object to those definitions of it. But in any case, again, if you think about an object here, it's moving faster towards the east, and an object here has only the rotational component of the Coriolis effect. If we think about an object that is moving, such as a cloud, from north to south, and oppositely in the southern hemisphere from south to north, this cloud, as it's moving, the earth is turning underneath it. And unless this cloud is moving at 364 meters per second to the east, which it normally would not be doing, is if it's just drifting towards the south, directly towards the south, the earth is turning underneath it, and as the earth turns underneath it, it looks to us standing out here in outer space, it looks like the cloud has moved off to the right relative to the direction that it's going. The cloud hasn't changed its path at all. It's just that the Earth has turned underneath it and it, so it looks like the cloud has moved off to the right. And we get the same thing going on in the southern hemisphere. If a cloud's moving directly towards the north, as the Earth is turning underneath it in this direction, it looks like the cloud is moving off to the left, but in fact, all the cloud did was stay on its path. The Earth moved underneath it, and in, by the Earth moving underneath it, it looked like the cloud moved off towards the right or the left. That's what the Coriolis effect is. The Coriolis effect takes into account that apparent change in direction due to rotation of the Earth. So look at this figure, 812, and study it in a way that I just told you, uh, and I think that should make some good sense to you. If we look at an, an Earth with no rotation, of course, this is exactly what should happen, right? No rotation, the cloud starts, cloud stops. Of course, with no rotation, we'd have no sunrise, no sunset. One half the Earth would be boiling hot, the other would be frigid cold. It'd be a much interesting, much different planet, and perhaps very interesting. So look at this as well, figure 813b. So, if we start here, Earth rotates, it looks like the cloud stops here, it looks like, again, that relative to the cloud itself, if you think about the cloud, it looks like it's moved off towards the right, okay, even though this is a left bending arrow, but it looks like this arrow should probably go more like that. It's moved to the right, okay, and we get the same thing in the southern hemisphere. So, study these figures. I, I think they should be pretty apparent to you. This might be an easier one if we have a cloud that's, <clears throat> excuse me, a cloud that's moving towards the north, then as the earth turns underneath it, it looks like it's moved off towards the right. Okay, so we have deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere and deflection to the left in the southern hemisphere as the earth is rotating underneath it.